Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to have an opportunity to talk to such a broad audience about polyketides and polyketide biosynthesis. What I'm going to do today is talk to you about this subject in three parts. The first part is essentially a historical overview of what polyketides are, why they are important, and what brought us, what kind of background chemical and biological knowledge brought us to the point where we are uh, today. The second part will focus primarily on the impact of genetics and molecular biology on polyketide biosynthesis. And the final part will focus on the mechanisms by which nature makes polyketides and what's in it for us as engineers. To motivate what I have to say this morning, what I thought I would do is draw an analogy with another class of biomolecules that you know a lot about already, which are proteins. So there's been at least 50 years of intense biosynthetic investigation into how proteins are made. And what I've tried to do in this slide is summarize for you in a few bullets what the take home message is of all of this work. So the, the studies on biosynthetic aspects of proteins have taught us that, uh, that, that proteins are made by these remarkable machines called ribosomes and they utilize a set of instructions, genetic code that is highly modular in nature. What I mean by the word modular in protein biosynthesis is that you've got codons where the upstream codon does not influence the performance of the downstream codon and vice versa. Now, what our understanding of the genetic code and ribosomal protein biosynthesis has done for us is it's created a lot of practical technology. So, most of you probably don't study protein biosynthetic chemistry, but most practitioners in modern bioscience and biomedicine use the capabilities of the protein biosynthetic machinery to make their favorite proteins day in and day out. And part of that is driven by the fact that our knowledge of protein biosynthesis is sufficiently mature that we've been able to create workhorse factories like E. coli that can allow for abundant access of proteins uh, from just about any source. So if you have your favorite gene and you'd like to make milligrams or perhaps even gram quantities of the, the protein encoded by that gene, all you do is you put it into E. coli using appropriate machinery and the fact that the genetic code is universal allows you to make your favorite protein, whether it's from a human or from an elephant, in E. coli. What our understanding of genetic, uh, of, of protein biosynthetic chemistry has also done is it's taught us how to manipulate these very complex biomolecules essentially at the level of individual atoms. So our ability to take a molecule with a 50,000 Dalton molecular weight like your typical protein and manipulate, do atomic level surgery on that molecule is a direct result of our understanding of protein biosynthetic machinery. And this protein by engineering capability and the protein production capability essentially underlie the modern biopharmaceutical industry where proteins are prime candidates for therapeutic applications, but not just anymore just therapy, but also for a variety of other applications. So for example, a lot of material scientists are very interested in the materials properties of proteins and one can be sure that 10, 20 years from now, you're going to have proteins that do things that are commercialized, that do things that other than simply make people well. So, when you look at the impact of understanding protein biosynthesis uh, 
one recognizes that one has essentially seen the emergence of an entire new set of practical capabilities as a result of what we learned at a fundamental level. And I'd like you to think about that as a backdrop when you think of, when, I, when, when you hear me talk about polyketide biosynthesis. Namely, that the understanding of polyketide biosynthesis can allow us to become better polyketide engineers and that in turn could have an impact on human health and related activities. So what are polyketides? Polyketides are complex small molecules that come from natural sources. I've shown you here nine polyketides. Uh, they come from a variety of different biological sources, mostly from microbial sources, and they are antibiotics. There's probably on the order of a few thousand polyketides that have been discovered to date from various sources. And what's particularly interesting about this class of molecules is an amazingly large number of them have actually been harnessed for human health and related types of applications. So this top row over here contains molecules like erythromycin, tetracycline, uh, rifamycin that are household names when it comes to infectious diseases. Most of you, perhaps all of you, have taken one or more of these antibiotics when you've had some kind of infectious disease. And it's fair to say that polyketides such as this have had a great impact on human health over the years. These are what one would call relatively mature antibiotics. They were discovered decades ago but continue to enjoy importance in the clinic. In the middle row, what you've got are let's call them relatively newer antibiotics, antibiotics that were discovered in the 70s, 80s, uh, that, were, that, were, uh, that were commercialized as drugs uh, and animal health products in the 80s and 90s, such as avermectin, which is an antiparasitic agent, uh, FK506, and doxorubicin, which is an, uh, a cancer chemotherapeutic. And in the bottom row, what you have are antibiotics that are newer antibiotics that are still under clinical development, such as epothiolone and galdanomycin, both of which are uh, anti-tumor antibiotics, as well as this interesting molecule shown over here, discodermalide, that comes from a source that thus far has not been well exploited, namely the ocean. It comes from a deep sea sponge and is probably made by a microorganism that lives in the sponge uh, and gives us an opportunity to think about polyketides, where they might come from in future. So when you think about polyketide drug development, there's good news and there's bad news. If you're a glass half empty kind of person, uh, you would say that polyketides are expensive, which they are. They are very difficult materials to make and especially in the early stages of drug development of a polyketide, they can be extremely expensive. A gram of polyketide in the early stages of drug development is worth much more than a gram of gold. Uh, they're also very complex molecules and hence they are difficult to analog. And as you know, one needs to make many analogs of an interesting prototypical bioactive molecule before one can find a drug that meets all the criteria that are required from the viewpoint of safety and efficacy. And polyketides are very difficult molecules to manipulate. So when you put A and B together, you might get the impression that this field is on its way out. However, one has to bear in mind that the technologies that we use today for discovering and making polyketides are more or less similar to the technologies that were used to discover and commercialize penicillin. And so in some sense this field has not changed a whole lot in the past 50 years and to the extent you share the viewpoint that uh, my viewpoint that as the knowledge of of, 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 of polyketide biosynthesis matures and as the technological capabilities become better, 
so will there be improved opportunities for ameliorating these basic problems. You might see this as a glass half full type of an opportunity. And so fundamentally what we need to do is understand how polyketides are made. The better we understand these interesting biosynthetic processes, not only do we get fundamentally new insights into biochemistry, but we also are able to exploit this knowledge for engineering polyketides. And much of what I have to say in the next two modules of my talk focus on these two points. There is one point that I'd like you to think about after my talk that I will briefly touch upon but not elaborate on, which in my mind represents the frontier in this field. So today I am talking about the chemistry of polyketide biosynthesis. However, when nature evolved polyketide biosynthesis, it did so probably for a reason. And that reason probably was a biological reason. We don't have much of an understanding of how polyketide, of, of what, what were the driving forces that led to the development, to the evolution of polyketides. And to the extent in the future one can connect polyketide chemistry to polyketide biology, you have the possibility to make a link that could be an enormously powerful engineering tool. Okay, so before we go into 21st century uh, polyketide biosynthesis, what I thought I would do is briefly review with you the basics of what we've learned over the past 50 years uh, about polyketides and how they are made. Uh, the simplest polyketide, it's not an antibiotic, uh, but nevertheless is an important biological molecule is this molecule down here of fatty acid. A fatty acid is, if, so the biosynthesis of a fatty acid is catalyzed by an enzyme system called the fatty acid synthase and at the heart of this fatty acid synthase are two thiols uh, shown over here a thiol, a thiol in, at one active site which is called an acyl carrier protein and a thiol at a second active site called the condensing enzyme or the ketosynthase, sometimes KS for short. The biosynthesis of this fatty acid down here happens two carbons at a time where the ketosynthase has anchored to it the growing fatty acid chain and the acyl carrier protein has an alpha carboxylated building block, a malonal building block that comes from a core metabolite that exists in all cells called malonal coenzyme A. Malonal coenzyme A, as you may recall, is the first dedicated intermediate in fatty acid biosynthesis and because of its nucleophilic character, it can attack an electrophilic thioester bound to the ketosynthase to form a carbon-carbon bond with a beta keto ester shown over here. So the result of the attack of malonal coenzyme A onto this thioester is the production of this acyl carrier protein bound beta keto acyl thioester Essentially, you have elongated the chain by two carbon atoms. This beta carbonyl that is generated during fatty acid biosynthesis is, function, is, is, is a reactive functional group. The ketone is a reactive functional group and can be reduced into an alcohol by a keto reductase. That beta hydroxy functionality can be dehydrated to give you an olefin, an alkene and that alkene can be hydrogenated by an enoyl reductase to give you a fully saturated methylene center. And so this process of condensation, keto reduction, dehydration, and enoyl reduction takes you from highly oxidized molecules to essentially lipid, which can then return back 
onto the ketosynthase as a, as a two carbon extended chain and can go through this pathway round and round until you get to a full length chain down here which is then released by an enzyme called the thioesterase to give you your fatty acid. So the fatty acid synthase comprises of a transfer enzyme, an acyl transferase that plucks out the malonal groups from the cell metabolism, the pool of metabolites that exists in the cell, moves it on to the fatty acid synthase. You got a ketosynthase, ketoreductase, dehydratase, enol reductase, and thioesterase, all of which come together through a series of iterative reactions to give you a fatty acid. Now, fatty acid looks like a relatively boring molecule, and it is. Uh, however, polyketides tend to be much more interesting. So down here, I have shown you the structure of the macrocyclic core of the antibiotic erythromycin that will be the centerpiece of much of what I have to say this morning. What you see over here is unlike a fatty acid, the erythromycin core, which is called 6-deoxyerythronolide B, is a much more interesting looking molecule. It's got functional groups appended to it. There's lots of methyl groups, alcohol groups, ketone groups. There's this large ring system that exists out here, a 14-membered ring system that exists. And perhaps most importantly, there's a lot of stereocenters in the molecule. Chirality is something that polyketide synthases are masters at. You've got 10 stereocenters in this molecule, each of which could be in one of two orientations. And so you've got 2 to the 20 possible ways, 2 to the 10 possible ways to make an erythromycin. And of course, nature chooses only one chiral version of all those two to the 10 possibilities. So what is different between the synthase that makes erythronolide down here versus the synthase I showed you in the previous slide? The basic difference is that the number of choices that this synthase, the erythronolide synthase makes are much more than the number of choices that a fatty acid synthase made. A fatty acid synthase only used malonal coenzyme A, one variety of, of uh, building block. Uh, polyketide synthase can use a variety of building blocks which, which vary based on what this R functional group is over here. A fatty acid synthase always goes through this cycle of con condensation, keto reduction, dehydration, enol reduction before it's returned back here. In a polyketide synthase, you can make choices. The enzyme can go all the way around like a fatty acid synthase and generate a fully saturated molecule, or the enzyme can abort the chain elongation and modification at any one of these stages. If it aborts, the chain modification at this beta carbonyl stage and returns it back to the condensing enzyme, you now end up with a ketone that's left in the molecule. And you see down here in erythromycin, you have a ketone at this position. So this ketone was presumably generated from by, by that kind of a mechanism. If the, if the keto reductase does what it's supposed to, but the dehydratase does not exist, you will return back to an alcohol, and indeed there are some alcohols in the molecule, double bonds or fully saturated molecules. So depending upon how the enzyme decides to work and where it decides to return the chain, you can get much higher levels of functionality on a polyketide. And finally, you have a thioesterase like the fatty acid synthase, except here the thioesterase is making a more interesting choice. Instead of just using water to hydrolyze that fatty acid, as was shown in this earlier slide where you ended up with a carboxylic acid, in this slide what you see is that an alcohol within the, fat, within the polyketide chain is used to cyclize the molecule into this lactone. So, Polyketides are essentially cousins of fatty acids, more interesting, more colorful cousins, if you will, of fatty acids. Now, 
Much of what we learned about polyketide synthase, polyketide biosynthesis, came from chemical studies uh, that are not that different from the chemical approaches used to elucidate general metabolic pathways like the Krebs cycle or fatty acid biosynthesis or various uh, pathways of that sort. So for example, I told you in the earlier slide, a fatty acid, a polyketide synthase makes, takes building blocks like malonyl coenzyme A or methyl malonyl coenzyme A or ethyl malonyl coenzyme A and makes polyketides like erythromycin. How do we know that? Almost 50 years ago, scientists did experiments such as using labeled forms of propionic acid in the context of erythromycin or acetic acid, propionic acid, butyric acid in the context of a related antibiotic called tylosin and showed that you can get propionic acid to label all the backbone carbon atoms of erythromycin, whereas in order to label the, back, the macrocyclic core of tylosin, you need acetic acid which will label at this position, for example, these two carbon atoms here come from acetic acid. Propionic acid labels many of the carbons where you have these methyl branches like here or here or here. And butyric acid labels this position right here. And so what you've got is choices being made by the enzymes that make erythromycin or tylosin. And that was a kind of an experiment that could be done way back in the 50s and 60s. In the 70s and 80s, there emerged chemical technologies that allowed chemists to do very powerful chiral enantioselective synthesis of more elaborate intermediates associated with polyketides. And that allowed chemists to answer some more interesting questions about polyketides like erythromycin. So for example, in this slide, what this result tells me is that erythromycin is made out of seven propionic acid equivalents. What it doesn't tell me is at what point is this alcohol converted into an alcohol? Is it done so the way a fatty acid synthase makes it makes fatty acids, namely it reduces the, uh, the ketones into an alcohol, the alcohols into, uh, into fully saturated methylenes at each stage in chain elongation, or do these functional groups show up after the full polyketide chain is made? To address that question, what scientists did was they took, they made synthetic, biosynthetic intermediates like the one shown over here. Now what this compound does is essentially mimic this portion of the polyketide, the erythromycin polyketide chain. And so this synthetic compound has a methyl branch here, a methyl branch in the final molecule, an alcohol, which is this oxygen that's used to form this lactone ring system over here, and the carbon backbone, C5 carbon backbone over here is the same C5 carbon backbone over here. And what you're seeing happen out here is that the bug that makes erythromycin takes this intermediate and incorporates these two labeled carbon atoms exactly at this position. This tells us something very important. It tells us that the erythromycin synthase, whatever it looks like and however it works, sets the chirality and the functionality of the erythromycin molecule as the chain is being built. Similarly, you can do a similar experiment with the tylosin backbone where you can make analogous elaborate intermediates as shown over here and have them incorporated into the polyketide chain. So what's the bottom line? By the late 1980s, we knew quite well that fatty acid biosynthesis and polyketide biosynthesis are very closely related processes. What we didn't have any understanding of until then was what are the enzymes like? that do make polyketides and how do they get to be so much more intelligent than the typical polyketide synthase. 
And that understanding came from the world of molecular biology and genetics. So what I'm showing you over here is the discovery of the erythromycin synthase, which is the prototypical synthase that has existed in the polyketide field. And what the scientists who discovered the synthase cloned the genes that encode the erythromycin synthase learned was that the erythromycin synthase consists of three very large proteins shown out here, one, two, and three, each of which contains on the order of 10 or more individual domains. So each of these cylinders over here corresponds to one, your typical enzyme size domain in the range of 10 to 50 kilodaltons. And there's many of these domains strung together in these three proteins that together somehow come together to make erythromycin. And that's where the concept of modularity in polyketide synthases arose. So what the scientists who cloned and sequenced these enzymes observed was that the enzymes are organized in a manner that suggest that erythromycin is synthesized in a highly modular manner. You've got six major modules, one, two, three, four, five, and six. You've got an initiation module out here, and then you've got a terminating enzyme, or TE, at the, uh, at, at the tail end. And the way these enzymes were thought to come together, and this model has largely withstood the test of time, is in incremental steps. So erythromycin biosynthesis is initiated by taking propionyl coenzyme A from metabolism, loading it at the loading module, which will then be passed on to the first module over here that simultaneously picks up a methylmalonyl coenzyme A from a cell, incorporates that to make this dimeric unit by forming a carbon-carbon bond between this propionyl group and this alpha-carboxylated methylmalonyl group. Note, we've now made the stereocenter at this beta carbon at the, 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 analogous to what we saw in the earlier slide. This chain is then passed on to the next module, which, is, uh, which elongates the chain further and sets to the stereochemistry and functionality of two additional carbon atoms. A third module, which now leaves the beta ketone intact, so this carbonyl persists in the erythromycin antibiotic. A fourth module that now reduces the beta carbon all the way into methylene, and that shows up as a methylene in the erythromycin ring. The fifth, carbon, the fifth module that elongates the product into a hexaketide, the final module that makes the full length chain, and that is eventually released by the terminating thioesterase into the macrocycle. So erythromycin biosynthesis is analogous to modular protein biosynthesis in the sense that they seem to be modules of enzymes. The fundamental difference is, whereas in protein biosynthesis, your modules occur at the level of a template. The catalyst ribosome does, may, does the same thing regardless of what a template is. So it's the template that's modularized. In erythromycin biosynthesis, it seems like the catalyst itself is modularized. So you could think of nature having created one ribosome for every polyketide antibiotic it chooses to make. The last point I want to make about the history of erythromycin biosynthesis, which is applicable to many more other polyketides, is that polyketides are frequently prepared in a skeleton form and then decorated through various kinds of modification reactions to give you the final natural product. So erythromycin A is a doubly glycosylated molecule. You see two glycosyl groups on erythromycin and there's two hydroxylations 
oxygen insertions that happen that did not exist in this molecule. And these are typically done by more conventional chain decorating enzymes like your typical metabolic enzymes. As I mentioned, there are thousands of polyketides out there in nature and each polyketide has its own dedicated polyketide synthase. So what I'm showing you here is the synthase that makes this emerging polyketide antibiotic called epothylone. Epothylone is an anti-tumor antibiotic that's undergoing clinical development in many parts of the world. And what you see over here is a much larger and more complex synthase that makes epothylone. So this natural product over here is made by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten modules, which play a hand-me-down bucket brigade kind of game, introduce more interesting functionalities. So this thiazole, this heterocyclic moiety over here, is actually introduced by a module that makes a peptide bond instead of a polyketide carbon-carbon bond. And you've got much more variety that's being introduced into the chain. So here, for example, you've got an R group that varies. If, you, if this module picks a malonyl unit, you'll have an R that is a hydrogen atom and you'll get epothylone C. If this module picks a methyl malonyl unit, you'll have a methyl group at this position and you'll end up with epothylone D. This is a more elaborate synthase, but the basic principles are entirely analogous to the erythromycin polyketide synthase, and so is the modular concept. So, in summary, between 1950 and 1990, we learned several things about erythromycin and polyketide biosynthesis that set the stage for more intensive manipulation and dissection of polyketide biosynthesis. By 1990, one started to see that the knowledge that we were gaining about polyketide biosynthesis using genetic tools and chemical tools started to merge. The pictures were similar. What we learned by feeding experiments was similar, was teaching us similar and complementary things to what we learned from molecular biology. And that was good because what you started to see was an emergence, was, 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 was a merging of chemi chemistry and biology. Uh, what you also saw was the understanding that this concept of modularity can exist in a field that most biologists don't think about as a particularly fertile hunting ground for modular systems, namely metabolism. So when you think about modularity, you think about nucleic acid chemistry, you think about protein chemistry, you don't think about metabolism like Krebs cycle or those kinds of pathways. Here what you're seeing is metabolism being quite modular and that leads to some very fundamental evolutionary questions that unfortunately I don't have time to discuss. So the, the, the paradigm that metabolism can occur in a modular fashion was a very important theme and probably is the reason why I'm invited to give this talk over here. And finally, what I want to point out, which will be the starting point for the next two modules of my lectures, uh, will be is that the erythromycin antibiotic turned out to be or still continues to be a wonderful model system in which we can investigate the chemistry and biology of polyketide biosynthesis.